record. So, so thank you. Well, good morning, all, and uh, good afternoon for some. Um, Randy Labonte here uh, with Canny Learn or the Canadian e Learning Network, as they formally are called. Uh, and it's uh, a wonderful opportunity to get together with folks and just have a little bit about professional development and professional learning opportunities and approaches that are happening across the country. Uh, the intent of this dialogue and conversation is to start to build towards our Teaching and Learning Online micro-credentialing program and start to build that forward as a, a national network that help, to help support some of the work that is happening in each of the regions, but also to help us build forward and learn from each other, which is really what the intent of the network is, is all about. So why don't we do some quick introductions, a little orientation first about uh, you can mouse over onto Zoom platform and you can find uh, little icons. You can share your screen, et cetera. Um, what I put in the text chat area, which is one window you do want to open so that we can converse um, in text chat, uh, is a link to a shared folder for our TLO program, but also, also uh, the Google Doc, which is where we're going to do some live notes. So I encourage anyone who would like to contribute and take notes as we go along to add in your thoughts to the Google Doc that is shared as we move along. But why don't we start with some introductions? And I said hello, Randy, from, and I should say geographically, I'm just north of Victoria, British Columbia, Vancouver Island. So not quite all the way on the West Coast, but close enough, about an hour's drive away from the, the Pacific Ocean. So um, why don't we move across uh, the country that way? So Gabe, you next. Sure, I'm uh, Gabe Linder. I'm physically in Vancouver. My office, uh, our school office is in Surrey, actually Cloverdale. Um, I'm the principal of Traditional Learning Academy Online, or TLADL. We're an online and blended program uh, with a little over 1,200 students all around BC and K through 12. Excellent, thanks Gabe. And I guess we'll move to you, Carrie. Um, my name is Kerry Klassen, and I'm in Hinton, Alberta. Um, I work for the Alberta Distance Learning Center, and we have uh, several campuses across Alberta serving um, Alberta students. I think we have approximately 50,000 students that we serve across the province and uh, some in two Northwest Territories and around the world. Um, and my role at ADLC, I'm a senior high English teacher, and I'm also part of the Blend Ed committee and our symposium is coming up this coming weekend and um, I'm also a member of Candy Learn and um, just enjoying the conversation so. <laughs> Thanks Carrie and Carrie's been a, a really really strong uh, advocate supporter and uh, worker bee shall we say for a lot of initiatives associated with Blend Ed as well as with Candy Learn so Welcome and glad you, you could make it. So um, maybe Michael and then Maggie and then Christine for intros. Just for uh, geography's sake, I'll let Maggie go first because she's <laughs> west of me. I'm close to the Ontario border, almost an Ontarian, but not quite. Here we go. Hi, I'm Maggie Dupuy. I'm uh, situated in, um, actually I'm working from home today in my home office, which is Mansfield. Quebec and we're just on the border of Quebec and Ontario as Michael said and uh, beautiful weather out here I don't know it's like in your neck of the woods but I've got some sunshine shining in so I'm very happy it's making me a happy day um, and thank you for inviting me uh, I'm, uh, I'm I'm the director for the e-learning division of learn uh, we take care pretty well of making sure that all the online services are available to uh, the students in the province uh, we work with all the school boards that are here and many of the Aboriginal groups as well, independent schools, and um, we have been working on professional development for years. I, we've been doing this since 2000. Actually, we initiated the, the uh, online learning in 1999, and uh, we've been doing it since that time. So my, I've been at this for 17 years, just about time to retire, I guess, but uh, I don't know if Michael will let me, but uh, what can I say? I'm enjoying myself. And, um, you know, we're here today to talk about the different processes we went through to change our, our PD practices, and we're extremely happy with what we were able to do. Michael, your shot. Thanks, Maggie. I'm, uh, hi everyone, for those who don't know me, I'm the CEO of LEARN. LEARN, just very quickly, nonprofit educational organization. We're located here in uh, Laval, which is just a little north of uh, where uh, Cassine is in, in Montreal. 
Uh, and as Maggie said, we've been providing online services to students for, for many, many years. Uh, I wear a couple other hats. I'm also the uh, chair of the Canadian e-learning network and I'm very proud to be uh, uh, working to try to bring together uh, uh, educational leaders from across Canada. And I, and I also, I guess, a third hat is I'm like a senior partner and, and consultant to uh, uh, Brain Cloud uh, Learning in Bangkok, which is uh, also Kassan, a uh, language learning uh, school, but uh, situated just a few miles down the road. Hmm. That's it. And then over to you, I guess, Kassan. Well, I think I have spoken already, right? Uh, if you don't mind doing a quick introduction because I have the record on this time. Okay, okay, okay. So my name is Christine Lepin. I'm the co-owner and uh, vice director of the AFSL Pro Language School located in Montreal. We've been uh, providing uh, online teaching across Canada and in other places like for the past five years. And uh, we are involved in many uh, development projects for uh, e-learning content. And I'm always on the lookout, you know, to find new information, new insights, and to connect with people who know more than I do. And so I learn a great deal and we like sharing and it's very exciting to uh, be able to uh, connect uh, with uh, people like, like you. I, I meant to uh, take part of the meetings for a while, but I've, I, I was so, I'm busy doing two jobs and now I have freed some time and uh, I really want to learn more about your group and, and what you do and uh, learn from other people. So thank you for inviting me. Excellent. Well, thank you. That's really what the whole focus and purpose of the network has been. Um, just for your way of background is that we would be go, go to other uh, conferences, uh, one iNACLES conference symposium in the US, and meet together and talk and learn and share and get all excited and come back to Canada and stop talking to each other. So we yeah. realized we needed to create something in Canada for us. And so that's what this network is really founded on. Most welcome to join in and when and as you can. So <clears throat> I'm just going to share share the screen so that we can watch this live as it goes. Um, let me get the right desktop. Yes, this is part of the issue with making sure that I actually uh, share the right one. So this is the document. So in, in thinking about this before we turn it over to Maggie to hear about Learn's approach, I was thinking, you know, well, what is the focus uh, and what can we how can we build something that we can take this uh, with us and take it away and continue this dialogue? As I mentioned, uh, I'll be attending at the Blundead in, in Edmonton, Alberta. Um, that's, this week starts on Sunday. So I'd like to bring this conversation forward into that, that, uh, that dialogue and conversation as well. So, I mean, what works in PD? What doesn't work? What are some of the emerging models that we're seeing out there? And what options or opportunities does it provide for us? But for me, as part of a network of, of educators across looking at blended and online learning, um, the question becomes what's needed and how can we leverage a national organization to help fill those gaps? So that's really uh, what I would hope at the end of this that we would sort of look to. Um, in my own research and looking at different PD approaches, um, you know, there's a lot of online PDs, there's webinars all over the place. You can have courses, some of them are MOOCs. Um, I see there's online professional communities that are working, a lot of educators using social media. Uh, there's some uh, school-based uh, focus uh, on team learning approaches that include some mentoring and coaching. There's the traditional workshops and conferences. Um, and then there's the commercial off the shelf or you know, programs that you can buy. So there's, there's a whole plethora or uh, potpourri of different um, online uh, training, professional learning experiences, opportunities, and directions to move in uh, to the point where it can be relatively overwhelming and somewhat confusing um, in terms of which is the most in the best direction to move uh, for for individual educators, teachers who are new, um, and who also are have been long in the tooth in the profession as well. So to me, one of the things that I've always found is that my own learning and the learning that I've seen successfully with other teachers that I, I'm involved in teaching uh, a couple of online courses uh, to, uh, to teachers as well. Um, when it's close to home, it's made relevant and, and clear and important as part of their own personal and professional practice uh, is when professional development and learning 
uh, really hits the mark. So what I'd like to do is maybe have Maggie talk to us a little bit about what Learn's approach has been uh, and find out what's been successful and then take that forward in terms of what are some of the, the takeaways that we have from that and then how can we continue to move forward to support an approach that will work for each of our respective um, organizations, but how can Candy Learn facilitate and support uh, nationally for that? So does that sound like a reasonable dialogue or does anyone have any other suggestions about what we should structure our dialogue here today? Okay, so so do you, uh, Megan, do you want to just maybe jump in now? Sure, and I'll ask Michael at any time to step in because it was a, um, when we decided on a, uh, a professional development plan, it was actually Michael I that sat down and took a look at that. What we are doing is our, our services are about 85% synchronous delivery online. We use a tool, we use different tools, live classroom tools, uh, throughout the 15, I'm uh, sorry, throughout the 17 years that we've been working in, and basically we really concentrated on uh, real-time instruction. And what we were finding, like we had really, we had really great uh, teachers working for us, but it was a very uh, teacher-led um, delivery uh, system. And uh, both Michael and I were somewhat concerned about this. I mean, you know, we, we brought people out of the regular system. We never taught online before we brought them into an online environment uh, where, you know, we, as we know, I mean, the whole situation is completely different, specifically because we often did not, um, were, were not unable to use video. Uh, it was all through voice and whiteboard mm. uh, instruction. So uh, we just found that, and so did the teachers, they didn't find that they were engaging the students. And that was their mo their biggest concern. And of course, the more you engage, you know, uh, the better the results will be for students. I mean, you know, they'll, they'll just seem to, to uh, you know, become more independent. They'll just seem to, you know, better take control of their own learning and then, you know, be more successful. So um, we started a research, we, we started to bring in, we talked to a lot of people that were doing uh, different forms of online learning and there weren't a lot of people out there that were doing the synchronous um, solution. Uh, but we did speak to a lot of people and what we did is we brought in the teaching team with us and we did a big brainstorming scenario when we talked about, you know, what their concerns were about, uh, you know, why they felt that they they needed to do a change in their teaching methods, and why also we felt that there was a need for teaching methods. So we started with a big brainstorming scenario, and we brought in some experts in the field, uh, you know, of asynchronous delivery, and we talked about engaging students. And then we brought in a lot of research. We did a few workshops together. And uh, from there, what we did is uh, we put together a plan um, basically to help the, the teachers grow. And the bottom line was we started off with growth plans for our teachers. And this worked extremely well because we knew where they were starting and then we had an idea of where they wanted to go. And they worked with Diane Conrad on this, uh, you know, uh, the first year of, of the transitions that we were doing and we just felt that um, it, it worked very well. The teachers started putting what they'd like to do in class, what direction they would uh, want to go in, you know, the, the, the different um, formats of instruction they would like to try. And that was the big, the most important thing is that we were opening the door to allow the teachers to participate and be in charge of their own uh, professional development. And at the same time, we were allowing them to, you know, we weren't uh, they felt free if they made a mistake, okay, it wasn't the end of the world, they could move forward. It was a whole learning process. And during the whole time, what we did is we gathered a lot of data to see how things were uh, moving forward. First things, we really wanted to concentrate on social constructivism. And what we found at the very beginning is not everybody had the same concept of what social constructivism was. So we had to start off with a... With a a foundation of what social constructivism was and what we, what direction we wanted to go with this. And then from there, what we did is we did, um, we continued to do a lot of the training and we allowed teachers to do some research of what type of strategies they would like to use in the classrooms. And uh, that's how we started the whole thing. Now, what's very, very important about our PD is our teachers and the, the principal of the school meet every week. And what they do, they do all the minutia for, you know, staff meetings, all through voice thread. Okay, so everything has to be done that's actually, you know, clinical for the, the actual functioning of their classrooms. So that's done outside of the meetings. 
So when they get together, um, what they do is they basically talk about professional development and they talk about it all the time. And we have some teachers who are very, very uh, proactive. They, they're always looking about new ways that they can find to engage the teachers and the students. Okay. And they're the ones that tend to be, you know, the ones that take the first step and they're, and, and some of them, of course, are, are seasoned teachers, they're not seasoned teachers, okay? And, um, and so um, it's, it's normal that they are a little less afraid to take a chance in the classroom and try a few new things, okay? So we have, we have some really great teachers, and one, two in particular, Peggy and Audrey, they're both math teachers, and uh, what they did, they kind of drove the whole thing. And some of them also were very, very interested in looking at flipping classes, or what we call mm -hmm. reverse um, instruction. Michael, did you want to add anything to this as I move forward? I, I did, Maggie, because I just because uh, I, I have to leave at one thirty, so I, you'll be able to continue once I'm gone. But I just wanted to add that for us, when we looked at at um, um, at our online teachers, we were generally ourselves not happy with what they were doing in the classroom. Um, as Maggie said, the classes tended to be very static. We were looking at talking heads primarily. And, um, and while they were very forceful and dynamic personalities, the, the pedagogy that they were uh, employing, the instructional methods, left a lot to be desired. Um, and so when we, we considered professional development, we, we didn't want to go that professional development route. We wanted to really go more professional learning. And that is to say, and I think uh, uh, both Randy and uh, Maggie alluded to it, is that the, the teachers had to really take ownership of this particular uh, uh, professional learning. It, it, it could not be something that was imposed uh, upon them. They really had to buy into it. And I think that just very briefly, we have all kinds of different professional development, professional learning. I think sometimes you see professional development and, and it's there to, to motivate, to, to reignite, to, to re-spirit teachers. And that's something that could be good and has value. Sometimes it's just to create an awareness but in our case, what we were really looking to do was much more than that. We wanted them to change their classroom practice. Mm -hmm. And so we know that there's a gap between knowing and doing. Yeah. And, and as a result, what we wanted to do here is to be sure that they really bought into it. Uh, and so we, as Maggie suggested, what we did is we worked really hard on having them look at themselves and become self-aware as teachers and, and uh, integrate into the whole process a metacognitive uh, component so that they could look at what they were doing in their online classes, uh, self-assess, um, and then and also work in, in, a, in a peer uh, format. It could not be, and we wanted to stay away from um, typical uh, PD where it comes from on high, the, the boss, the superintendent, the school district, uh, the school principal decides this is what the teachers need and that's what they get. Um, and so it's, it, it comes on from high. We wanted to stay away from that formula and we wanted them to, to buy into what we, what we wanted. And that was to have a, a much more dynamic, more progressive uh, type of pedagogy within our class. So that was the mindset that we brought to it. Um, and, and, and I can let Maggie fill in some of the, the, uh, the gaps, but uh, today the most important thing that we do is we support it and stay out of the way. Um, we don't try to play the role of uh, know-it-alls. Uh, again, we see this far too often in our school districts and this and superintendents, managers, whatever. They come in as the, uh, the experts and they, they, they do a lot of talking and very little listening. So today we, we support, we um, um, work as, as coaches, but the, um, at the end of the day, uh, the teachers have taken ownership, our online teachers have taken ownership of their PD, the professional learning, and, and they're driving it, and uh, uh, it works really, really well. The last comment I'll make is that uh, um, we insisted that they model all of this. It could not be, so the, in other words, whatever they were going to be doing in their classroom, they had to have been practicing it outside of the classroom with one another. So if we wanted them to uh, work, uh, we wanted to see collaborative work in the classroom, they had to be collaborating. If they were going to do inquiry in the classroom, they had to be doing inquiry. In other words, nothing that they expected of the students was not something that they had not already lived through and, and uh, uh, integrated into the way they operate and into their own professional learning. So uh, today, basically, we, we just sit by back and, and, and watch them go and we're constantly amazed at 
how much they do. But the, and again, that's the abbreviated version. But I would say find out what decide what your 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 objective is, um, uh, create a sense of self awareness of what they're 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 doing and how they're doing it. Um, let them model it. And, uh, and again, Randy, you said it earlier, it has to be relevant to them. I mean, uh, it, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't work if, if they're saying meaningless. We haven't, we've heard every teacher come back or uh, instructor come back to, went to a conference and I got these things I can use right away in class on Monday. Those are little classroom strategies, but uh, and they, I think they're temporary fixes, but more often than not, if you want to go further, you have to look at this as an ongoing process as well, that it's not just a, a one-off or a one or two uh, workshops. It's, it's an ongoing process and modeling and ownership are the cornerstones. And that's it. <laughs> Um, uh, there was a question from Carrie, and, and Carrie, the bottom line was, uh, yes, everybody had bought into it. Um, we had, had been doing professional development, and we, as a team, we talk a lot as a team of teachers, you know, we discuss how can we make, um, you know, the environment on the environment for the students very engaging and things like that. And they knew that there were things lacking. They knew through their, their results and things like that, that they really weren't hitting um, the uh, the time, not necessarily the timelines, but the, the benchmarks that they wanted to hit for students. And so what we did is we, we once they did their growth plans, they realized, okay, wow, there are things we have to do and also the reflections because the process when we put it into place, we did some reflective responses. We had them think about, we, we provided them with topics to think about and how did they could actually improve their online instruction and improve the engagement in the classroom. So it, it became a very reflective um, process and a very grassroots. So once they got, they understood what we were hoping uh, th that they would understand, okay, they took it from there. And really the bottom line was, was to help them understand that what we were doing was trying to improve uh, the end results in the classroom, but also the fact that students would be more engaged. And really that was what they always want. That was one of the things they would always come back to, you know, we're having a hard time getting the kids engaged, not responding when I asked them to ask them questions and things like that. And basically it was things that they were doing in the classroom that they had been doing in brick and mortar classrooms and not adapting them so that it would mm -hmm. force students to become engaged. Uh, we brought in things like questioning strategies and questioning strategies is one of the greatest strategies you can use with your, your students online because what it does is you, you question students in a particular way and when they ask you a question you re-ask the question in a way and you engage everyone else in the classroom to help that student respond to that question. So it becomes a very, the teachers, what they did is through the process of, of working on this, they started doing it amongst themselves. And as they felt confident, then they tried something in the classroom. You know, it's like, it's like, you feel a little safer when you're in a team of teachers. And that's what's really important. You have to make sure that they're good team of teachers, that they communicate well, and they respond well, and they respect each other. Now, there's always going to be the teacher who is pulled back a little bit. We had a few of those, you know, who held back a little bit. But you always have those that fly, you know, they're gone. They're, they're, they're gone ahead of everybody else. You know? And those are the people that really get everybody going. You know? And then the, once, and what they did is they would come back through all this PD we did on a weekly basis. They would explain to the other teachers what they did in the classroom, um, how it went. We would we used to call it the good, the bad, and the ugly. Okay. <laughs> sometimes it was really great, but sometimes it was really terrible. You know what I mean? And they say, oh my God, it flopped. And then we'd say, to them, well, are you going to keep trying it or not? Or, and then what they do is everybody would kind of discuss, just like we're doing today, how could we make it so it's a more positive in situation for the teacher, but also for the students. So the whole idea of regular PD every week and the minutia of getting, uh, you know, uh, staff meeting details out of the way by doing it through voice right really opened up the door to at least an hour every week where they talked about professional development. And they mm -hmm. talked about growth plans and where they wanted to go. And then they presented their growth plans. And then once they started that, then they started setting up within their team mentors. Because when somebody tried something to work really well, the other teacher said, well, would you mind showing me that? Absolutely. So all of a sudden we started developing um, and, and individuals who were ready to work together did not feel shy about not knowing something, were open to asking one another information. And if they didn't know, well, of course, Diane went out and tried to find as much information as possible and brought it forward. So the more they work together, the stronger the team began. You know, and it's like anything else. If, um, 
Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Of course. Michael said, yeah, they, they had to have fun. Oh, that was the most important thing. And mm -hmm. we weren't going to fire them or anything like that. You know what I mean? <laughs> like everything else. Everybody's a little afraid. Of, oh, if I try this, it does work. Or, you know, my evaluation will not be good. That wasn't the process. First of all, we were not evaluating. We were working on growth for the teachers. Okay. And that was well explained from the very beginning. Yeah. Lots of fun. It was important. And of course we, I was often invited. Oh, Maggie, we're trying this. We'd like you to see what, what you know, and, I don't always have that opportunity to be in the cities, and so that was really, really great. And there, you see Michael, his dissertation, Modeling Social Construction and Professional Development for Online Teachers. So Michael was able to talk to a lot of the teachers to the whole process. And if you let teachers talk about what they do, they feel really good about it. And that was the other thing. It's important that they're able to tell others what they were able to achieve. So all of a sudden what we were doing is we were allowing them to talk to brick and mortar schools. We were allowing them to go to conferences and talk about what they were doing. So all of a sudden that pride of their six of their successes was even being spread more. So that really got them more engaged. It's like anything else, you know, you 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 have to provide people the opportunity to find what they did. And then what really started happening then is uh, a few of the teachers really liked the idea of flipping classes. And of course, you know, we talked to a few people. And I remember when we first started teaching, someone told me actually a math consultant who I had great regards for. I was really disappointed because she told me, oh, you're never going to be able to teach you know, high math online. Well, that was one of the first courses we did. And we were very successful. So just like people said, oh, my, I don't think you're going to be able to flip classes online. Oh, my God. It's the best. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so we were able to do that. And that strategy has really engaged the students because the students have to do, like they're just not passive learners. They have to be very engaged. So there are all the different strategies that we put together to make the classes engaging. The flipping classes was probably a, a, a milestone for a lot of the teachers because all of a sudden they found ways that they could get students to um, take care of the content outside of the classroom so what they did is they made voice threads okay and all the content um that the students would have to know for a particular lesson was provided at, at night so that that was their home and what's nice about voice threads is it's very interactive so students must respond so it's not like they're just reading something and they're not responding so their students are able to make comments make videos make powerpoints in response to the teacher's information okay and then the teacher is able to look at all this and when the teachers go back to the classroom with the students, let's say the next day, they have a very good understanding of who hasn't understood the concepts, who, who needs extra help, and who could go into breakout rooms and start working. Because that's the other thing they did. They brought in, you know, more and more the use of breakout rooms where students work independently in teams. Um, uh, and, you know, like everybody was participating to the whole learning, learning process. And that's really what we wanted our teachers to do in the classrooms, to move from teacher-led to facilitators and to the fact that students would be leading a lot of time, a lot of the learning. And they do all kinds of things in the class, like in, with their, the students. They have Twitter um, encounters where everybody at night gets together and they do a whole Twitter uh, gathering. They talk about learning and things like that. So they also, the students are also engaged in learning PD on their own. So they, they do a lot of reflection about their learning. They do a lot of, uh, you know, explaining of how they learn particular things. Sometimes in the breakout rooms, a student takes on the role of explaining a particular way they do the particular problem, which opens up the door to students being able to listen to their, 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 um, their classmates and understanding there's more than one way to learn things and that, mm -hmm. you know, there's different ways that they can try things and become successful. At the same time, they feel pretty proud about the fact that um, they're able to do that with their classmates. So again, the whole idea of professional development for us has been an ongoing process and it never stops. It's always something new. There's always something new that Audrey or Peggy or Carrie uh, or Natalie are bringing to the, to the, the platform and say, you know, wow, uh, I've seen this. Uh, people are doing this in the classroom. Can we try it? Can one of us go to the conference and we bring back the information or share it? And the other thing is they present a lot together. Now, one of the nicest things for our teachers is that several years ago, Peggy and Audrey were... Um, uh, received an award at INA call for um, for instructional strategies. They um, they're really ex exceptional ladies, and um, uh, they have really pushed the envelope in a lot of areas. I mean, just in the platform we use, they push the envelope all the time. I'm continually getting things like, well, how um, 
can we, you think we can make this platform do this so we can do this in the classroom? Like things that nobody even thought about technically when they were building platforms, you know what I mean? So the bottom line is if you give the teachers the following, you show that you're confident that they will find ways to, to become innovative in classroom. You allow them to take risks and if they fall, you pick them up and say, okay, what's next step? What do you want to do next? You work together to assure that there's great communication and team effort within the team and that your um, principal or the individual who's in charge of the team really um, assures that there's time for professional development, not always time just for working and, and filling out forms and, you know, reporting marks, that a major part of their job is professional development and has to be done on a, on a regular basis. And maybe, maybe we're pushing the envelope in a weekly uh, meetings, but I'm going to tell you one thing, it has been the best thing we've ever done. So um, I'm extremely proud of, of the successes that our teachers have received. And, you know, once we did all of, we put all these things in place, of course, we surveyed. We surveyed the students, we surveyed the teachers, and, and the students would say, boy, the, you know, our online classes are really hard. Our teachers make us work hard because we have to do all the work, but it goes by so fast, we don't even realize the class is over. Mm -hmm. And uh, they say, you know, they wish some of their other classes, because many of our students are in brick and mortar schools, they really say, wow, I wish, you know, our other teachers would teach like this. And we even have some teachers who have come to us and are actually doing blended models uh, within the brick and mortar uh, classroom because of the results that we're getting using um, some of the strategies we use, you know, and, and of course, the online performance. Um, you know, it's like anything else. And the teachers, they, like, uh, I, I'm thinking of Peggy. Peggy is, uh, uh, Peggy is the epitome of a master teacher. She's not a young teacher. She's in her 60s. Uh, she's been teaching for many, many years. Um, she is probably the person I've seen the most change because, you know, she went from, from being a teacher who, you know, stood up and lectured and all of a sudden now is, is bringing in all kinds of new activities and strategies in her classroom. And the fact that we had enough confidence in her to do this, we provided her with an opportunity to share, to mentor other teachers, um, to experiment in her classroom, and to feel the support there if she wanted to try something who made all the difference in the world. So the so, bottom line is, let it be grassroots. Let it involve a lot of reflection on the part of your teachers. Uh, be sure that they start with a growth plan so they know where they're starting and they're where they want to go. And as the administrator with them or the evaluator, um, you know, be sure that you're supporting them and you meet them on a regular basis to be sure that we're providing the right opportunities for them to in their, in their um, ventures, that's what I call them, their ventures, and their experiences in the classroom. And um, uh, like I said, I, sometimes I just can't keep up with them. They're just, you know, they, <laughs> they run with it. And that's what, really what you want them to do. Um, yeah. Not everybody will work as fast as they will, but that's what you want them to do. Maggie, that's 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 excellent. There's there's so much there. And I, we were doing a little text chatting around trying to rationalize what you're describing in terms of other programs, say that are at ADLC or TLA online, and I'm thinking, uh, Kristen, as well, the same thing in terms of what what you've been using. So maybe, maybe an opportunity to do sort of a cross group check in on that. So, Gabe, you mentioned a, a little something about that your the strategies, the weekly PD is being affected. Maybe chat a little bit about that, and then Carrie will come to you. Oh, I mentioned that I think I think the weekly PD would be the most effective way to make uh, inroads and in, 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 uh, in different strategies. But uh, I know that um, I, I'm wondering how you're able to coordinate the, the mm -hmm. time uh, <laughs> because that's it seems to be pretty demanding. And to, to what extent is it kind of voluntary? People are buying in because you mentioned the fun and the uh, the, the positive aspects of it, but I know in, in my um, community of teachers, that would be seen as a, a little bit of a difficult ask, I think, to get people together and to find that hour when we're all available at the same time, too. So could you speak to how you, you work on that or how you address that? What we did is we set that up at the very beginning before any other meetings or any other things to be put into place. Okay, so that. Sorry, um, I don't think you're hearing, Gabe. Can you I'm hear? not hearing you very well. Okay, uh, I'll see if better. I can. Yeah. Okay, is this a little better? Hello? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, um, we, at the very beginning of the year before 
teachers started, we set up meetings. That was part of the process. Everybody set up a meeting. They set it into their schedules at the beginning of the year to be sure that it would not be affecting anything else. Okay, so that's the most important thing. It's, it's the whole process of setting this up. Secondly, um, the teachers were very willing to do this because they knew that if they were able to find helpful strategies at the very beginning and were able to share things with other teachers, they knew that it would, in the long run, it would just improve their ability to engage their students and, um, you know, and, and to become better teachers because it's all about reflection. You know, it's like anything else. You cannot force a person to do something they don't want to do, but they have to feel that it will be beneficial to them. And I think that's the bottom line. And that's how we approached it. You know, we came to them and said, you know, what PD do you need to do the job you want to do? And, um, and what we'd like to do is we, we're going to do a growth plan. Then we're going to share what everybody would like to do. And we found that a lot of people liked similar um, things. They wanted to try similar things. So those that were ready started and the others watched and um, you know, gathered the information. So what it allowed, it allowed those who were, who were ready to move forward and those who weren't to sit and monitor and when they felt comfortable, because as, as you know, you know, younger teachers are less experienced teachers, I shouldn't use younger, less experienced teachers were a little more afraid to try things. Um, and those that weren't afraid, well, they just tried it. And if it flopped, we all came together and we all had a, a laugh, you know, um, we didn't have pizza parties to bring them there. Okay. I mean, I know sometimes food is a, is a, re a good reason, but what we would do sometimes is we would have meetings and, and actually Diane would phone in all the different cities where the teachers were. And I remember one time she ordered pizza and pizza arrived at their, at their door to start off the sessions, you know, and we, she do little things like that, just things to make the whole process fun. And we'd always start with the good, the bad, and the ugly. And we'd allow people to talk about what really went bad this week, what really went good this week and what they would try again. So the bottom line, you have to make it fun. You have to make it so that nobody feels um, like they're being put on the spot. Um, and it has, they have to feel that they're in control. And it's the in control and making some decisions about this is the big thing. And they were willing. I don't know any teacher who wouldn't be willing. And if, and I, I'm going to say this and, and I hope I don't offend anybody, but you know, when you do have teachers who are not willing, well, then they don't fit well into the team and they really stand out. We did have one individual who is presently not with us anymore. And that's what happened. That person realized that they weren't in the right field um, or that they were not no longer able to move in the direction that would help to engage to their students. So they made a choice and they went on to other something else. In other words, in other words, they saw everybody getting on the bus and leaving and they weren't on the bus. No, they didn't even get to the bus station kind of thing. Yeah. So uh, I mean, those things do happen, you know, and it's like anything else. It's a learning process and a willingness to um, want to do this. But the bottom line is you have to build um, confidence within the teachers and the fact that they can trust the team of people mm. that work with. That's where you got to start it. And it, it didn't happen overnight, Gabe. It took a lot of time. It took us a whole year of getting everything in, in line and finding roles for different people because that's the other thing. People have to feel like they're fitting into the right role. And, you know, um, it's, it's, it was a, sometimes a, um, we made mistakes and sometimes we learned, well, most of the time we learned from them. Absolutely. We hoped we did anyways, but that's what was helpful. The fact that we gave them the time necessary and we allowed them to grow because everybody has to grow at a certain pace. We can't, when you start dragging people around along, it just doesn't work very well. So, so I'm curious. Thanks, Maggie. I'm curious, Gabe, in terms of how you see, uh, how many staff are, do you have and, what do you what do you take away from that the strategies? And then I'd like to kind of move to Carrie, who's at ADLC is a very very large organization that has a very different kind of a culture and approach. Well, a, a culture that's probably been well established. But uh, Gabe, why don't you kick off real quick? Yeah, this would certainly be like the micro versus macro approaches here because uh, we have about seventy five teachers on staff who are almost all well almost all remote. Um, how we address our, you know, building the community and doing Pro-D together currently is 
We have monthly online meetings where we usually just address general pedagogical, you know, have a discussion and we go into breakout rooms and Blackboard or in Zoom and then people come back together into the main room and talk about some of the main points that came out of those discussions. Um, we also kind of break out into smaller departments another time during the month where they will discuss more specific teaching strategies. And then uh, we try to build our uh, community by bringing teachers physically together twice a year. Uh, actually, into next week, we have our one, our first sort of staff training and conference. And then in April, we'll have another staff training and conference. So we bring teachers in from around the province and for, for two full days of kind of learning together. And uh, that's obviously helpful, just everyone getting together face to face and and uh, and will address, again, specific skills there. But time is so precious in those two days that you want to have that balance between team building and, and learning useful strategies and just working together and the time time away from the usual um, day to day activities. So what I take away away from that, um, um, from what Maggie's saying is, uh, I mean, I would definitely like to, once I go through the growth strategies that we that we're currently working on some self evaluation that teachers have done and identifying certain areas that we can bring in some either weekly or bi weekly um, sessions on specific strategies um, that teachers are identifying widely as as uh, things that would be useful to them. So. Um, I guess just the frequency, and I, I know that's something that teachers do, teachers who work remotely, they, they would like that to have more, um, to be more connected than once or twice a month online. And so I, mm -hmm. I think you know, there's a lot of value in that. Yeah, thanks Maggie. Oh, it was, if I could ask one more question I wanted to ask Maggie is, do, do you Maggie, um, uh, and sorry if I missed this part, but do you, did you, do you always plan things around a certain, you know, this, this week is going to be all about strategies and voice thread and you have a plan a month in advance or would it sort of develop organically and it's just a time that people are coming together? Uh, well, I, I know that Diane sends out some feelers on a regular basis and she says, guys, what do you want to talk about? What would you like to discuss Are there specific areas? And um, at the very beginning of the year before, like once we set up our, our meetings or how, you know, we're going to have meetings, put that in here every Monday at, from one to two or three to five, you know, whatever, you're going to, we're going to have a meeting. You'll get all the other information through voice threads, which will reduce, you know, um, the housekeeping needs and things like that. Then what we did is um, they had a brainstorming session where they talked about things that they would like to do this coming year. What PD they felt they would like to investigate, uh, what areas they would like to expand on. And at the same time, what we did is it was kind of an opportunity for us to get um, people working together. Because, you know, some area people wanted to work, you know, on Twitter feeds and how they would make them interactive for their students, like in the evening when a student needs a quick answer. Uh, Peggy's available from such a time, such a time. The kids can send her a Twitter, uh, a tweet. She responds, she gives them a quick answer, get back to style, can continue on with their homework or their assignment that they're doing. So, I mean, you know, they would talk about these things and we would try to group the people in the areas of professional development where they would like to expand, making sure that they didn't forget about all the other stuff that was going on. But as I said, people are ready for certain things at certain times. And this is the biggest, um, I think that's the most important thing you have to do with this. And since you, with your group of 75, you may have to divide your people into common, into groups that have common uh, needs or common, uh, you know, requirements. And I think that would be a good way to do it. And then find a way where you can come across uh, and do some cross pollination, you know, of, of some of the great ideas that you're doing. And it's really good sometimes, like I know that Diane sometimes, like let's say Peggy did something incredible this week with, um, with math. I don't know. She used Jobra or some other product and she brought it into classrooms and the kids loved it. Well, we, she always makes sure that every week people get a chance to talk about that and how effective it was. And that's why the good, the bad, and the ugly, okay? And those things that are really ugly, well, we just, okay, we will try those again because, hey, it was a flop. Or maybe there's ways we can make it better. But I think what you, if it was my situation, the way I would look at it is I would divide the people up according to common interests. Um, it could be subject-based as well. We got a lot of math and science people, so they kind of work well together, you know? And, uh, and, and then from there, you know, you, but I said it, it took us at least a year to get everybody going in the right direction. And the bottom line is it takes time. 
Okay, it's not something that's going to happen overnight. You're going to have those yes, they're going to fly, and but you're going to have those that you know are hanging on really tight to uh, to the, the legs of the of the chair and they don't want to move, you know. And so those are the people that you have to kind of introduce those things slowly, but start with the growth plan. Everybody has to do the growth plan. That's what we started with. They all had to do it. And then what we did is we met with them individually and said, you know, how do you think you can move forward? Because this is what you want to do. Because we we set it up in in some really good ways that they could talk about what they really like to do in their classrooms and then from there they move forward and you nothing wrong with having people working together on a growth plan either you know if you're if you're using doing a project together well then you say okay this is a growth plan for the project because they understand the idea of growth plan they feel comfortable with it it's not threatening and so then they can move forward with that and then they work together collaboratively but our teachers love to work together. you know that's the reason so, so on that note, I'm wondering, um, and Christian, I'm thinking in terms of maybe after Carrie that you can talk a little bit about how this approach, et cetera, and how it fits with what you're doing. But Carrie, so professional growth plans are part of ADLC's practice, et cetera. And certainly I know from my own experience in talking with folks in your, in, at ADLC, you do a lot of sort of curricular based uh, connections and conversations. So tell us a little bit about what's resonating for you and then what your takeaway is here from LEARN. Um, I think what resonates with me the most is just the, the idea that um, teachers found their passion again. Um, I feel like there are teachers, you know, like especially online teachers where we kind of are in our own little world and our own silos and it's really hard to remember the passion that you had and why you got into teaching and um, so I really like that that your, your team just seem to find that passion again and, and use that to help kind of propel them forward. Um, as Randy mentioned, you know, ADLC, we all, all the teachers have to do a professional growth plan at the beginning of the year where we outline a, a goal that we want to accomplish. And it can be, you know, around pedagogy or um, technology, like how do you want to use technology to improve your learning practice, etc. teaching practice. Pretty much anything goes as long as you can connect it back to um, our school division um, goals and our provincial educational goals. So we have a lot of things that we have to kind of are responsible for. Um, and then as a school, we have, you know, several goals that we want to focus on as a school. And I think for me, that's where I see the least amount of buy-in from teachers is because the goal is not personal to to us sometimes. Um, so then it, I think administration really struggles with getting us to kind of get on board. Um, I'm the PD committee chair at ADLC and so one of my jobs is to bring PD to the teachers that connects to that goal. <laughs> sometimes it's really hard to you know, get people to come or even say what they would like to see or do because they're not really that interested anyway, so they don't really care. You have to go, it's required, so um, they don't necessarily put themselves out there or get involved if they're not um, keen on it. And we have, a, I think, I want to say we have four professional development days per year where we as a school are closed. Closed. Um, our students, you know, we let our phones go to voicemail. We don't answer our email and we focus on professional development as a school. And um, the rest of the time, like if we, if other PD that we want to do, like Blend Ed or Canny Learn Symposium coming up or other types of like, Iana call, things like that. If they are connected to our personal growth plans, then we can we can go and do those things and attend those things. But um, there's not really a lot of uh, opportunity to go to those types of PD things if it's not in your growth plan. <laughs> so it's interesting. I saw some head nods about uh, the teachers about um, you can you know lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Kind of PD activities and approaches. And, and uh, what I was hearing and learned was that uh, the keys to professional development, training, learning were handed to the teachers 
and, and they're, they're encouraged that. So it's flipping the paradigm around. And that's not unlike what we're talking about in a lot of uh, pedagogy and curricular changes in making learning personal to the individual and facilitating their own sort of growth journey in, in that. So to me, I think the two kind of go hand in hand. And what I was hearing from you, Maggie, was that that was a strategy that was used to engage students as well. And then it was used to engage teachers. So I'm wondering, Christine, if you've got some comments about that. I see some head nods. So maybe a little bit about what you're taking away and what you're doing currently. I, and you have to click the mic back on. You're muted. <laughs> Thank you. So first yeah. of all, Maggie, uh, I just want to say that I really listened to everything you, you said with great interest. For me, this, this would be a dream if I could do it at my school. But I come from a different universe. I'm in the private sector, which doesn't mean that it does not resonate with our reality. But there's no way that we can pay teachers every week for a certain amount of time and, you know, block all the courses that are going on just to put them together in a room. So we have to uh, find different ways of um, making it happen. Any teacher teaching at our school has to undergo training with the, our training uh, director. And uh, the, that person follows does a follow up with them on a personal basis, what works, what doesn't work, how we can help develop, you know, become uh, to adapt their teaching uh, strategies and material for online training. We also develop a great deal of things it's like a, a buffet and, and, and the teacher has a lot of things that are ready to use. And, and we're always trying to strike the balance between leaving enough oxygen for creativity and, and then having enough things ready so that they can, you know, create a course with, uh, little t in little time and to have high quality material ready. We use Moodle and uh, we have a teaching platform. So they undergo training for lots of different tools and at the beginning it's very confusing and it always takes a while before they get the hang of it. And some people are really thriving in that environment and others it's not just for them. And uh, we uh, try to encourage the students and, and of course also the teachers who, who show real interest. Um, one of the things we do, for example, we have contracts with the federal government, certain big corporations, and um, we, our teachers teach intensive uh, uh, training programs to some students, like private students mostly, and we have like team teachers. So there is a leading teacher, we have three teachers. So every student has four teachers because if you undergo an intensive program, you don't wanna spend like eight hours a day online with the same person. So after each uh, the training session, they, they, they have reports and everything sums up in the history and everybody knows what everybody else has been doing and they are in touch on a regular basis. And every two weeks or so, the leading teacher and the coordinator here and all the teachers get together and they discuss what worked with a particular student and what didn't work. And then they exchange like uh, tips and strategies and things like that. So we have noticed that when they are talking about something specific that really teaches the teacher in its practice, it becomes real and they wanna learn what their colleagues are doing because they're teaching with, with the same student and, and something happens during these meetings and we always have like we have different tools where we can leave traces of that and and that helps a lot to stimulate them and they become more innovative and you know they know that colleagues are going to uh, look at what they do so there's a bit of peer pressure here a peer pressure element and that works very well usually uh, that type of settings uh, we are getting uh, we see that the, the interest is is real and the the quality of the teaching uh, is there. So that's, that's one of the, the things we do. But we are always trying to find how much do we need to help them and how much oxygen do we have to leave? And for some, some, some teachers, they need more, others less. So every teacher is a new, uh, a new case. We are trying to go case by case as, as much as we can. We have about 40 teachers now. And it's, it's work in progress, you know. We are learning every week and we're trying to get better all the time and to provide like a pedagogical development learning opportunities for the staff, not just for the students. 
Just to add to that, um, you know, it's a growth uh, process for all of us. It was a growth process for us as administrators. It, it just didn't come naturally. You know what I mean? Yes, uh, of course. A system where, you know, you, you evaluated each teacher every year. So many years you evaluated people and stuff like that. And what we found is when we made it more a social event of where we celebrated successes, where we, um, we accredited people with training. And, and this is something we started this year was what we call the badging program where we actually, I had to train all the summer school teachers. And what I did is I made it into a badging program and we think of this about a, a professional development and it was all based on reflection. And okay. we found that the, the teachers really, really got involved in that. They liked that. They learned a lot about it. Because, you know, when you're teaching someone to teach online, they're just thinking about technology, but they're forgetting about the pedagogy. Absolutely. Really Absolutely. Combine that together just then and made for... Um, a really, really uh, great opportunity for people. But it's like anything else. People want, have to want to. And uh, again, the grouping of people in the right groups who work well together is also yes. an important thing. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. Yeah, and it's interesting, Christine, you talked about oxygen. It's it's a question of, it's almost like with, with teaching students, it's carrot and stick. Sometimes you want to create an incentive, other times you want to encourage that, but sometimes you just need to get out of the way and let yes. them go. Um, yes. And it is, it is a balance and, it, and it's never perfect. It's more almost the art of helping to learn. So uh, thanks, Carrie, for putting the email in there. I'm wondering if folks want to connect and carry a conversation on afterwards, but I do want to sort of, before we hit the top of the hour, um, ask the question, what can Canny Learn do to help support um, in this kind of sharing and dialogue, which we've had here for, for this hour today, um, in terms of moving forward and keeping the conversations fresh and the connections for you uh, going forward. So what, what, what would you think, what would be a good thing that we could do through the network to continue to support what, what you're doing, but also help uh, you to move forward, Carrie, you know, in terms of PD if you're ADLC or Gabe with yourself or Christine, et cetera. So any thoughts on that? You can just open the mic or whatever. Thank you, Maggie. So would, should we come back to this kind of conversation again? Should an online community, one of the things that we've done is we've set up a, a member's site um, as a possibility uh, or a sort of a micro-credentialing program using some badging systems as well we've talked about. Should we do something formally through the network or should we just keep the informal grassroots dialogue moving forward? Um, I, I kind of like the idea of, a, of it being informal and uh, what it, what's good is it's a lot of sharing going on and I think that that's what's important. And I think, you know, after we have these kinds of sessions, if people want to find out more or want to get together and discuss more or find opportunities of ways that we can integrate some of the solutions that some of us have found, well, I'm, and then I think that's, like for me, that works very well. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm up to for any of this kind of opportunity. It's like anything else, anything I bring back from all of you folks, I always give back to Diane who works with the teachers and it's always positive for us. Okay, excellent. Okay, yeah. well, mm-hmm. Well, it's, I, I, I like the idea of the micro-credentialing. I'm not sure exactly what you have in mind there about like uh, specific um, skills that you would get a badge for kind of thing or Part of the skills, part of the knowledge and background, that sort of thing. Uh, one of the things that I do is I'm teaching, and it, it launch again in November, um, a uh, Teachers Who Want to Teach Online. It's a program that uh, for Vancouver Island University. Um, so I like to take that, and I'd like to move it out into an open practice area. Mm -hmm. uh, and then if folks want to engage in it, they can. So I think it's just another alternative and option around professional learning. So that if you're not engaging in a community approach driven out of your own school, like some of you are, um, but if you're an individual, maybe you can engage with others in something a little bit more specific. So I think it's something that we will continue to pursue through. And Gabe, that what I'm hoping to do is have have a you know sort of a pilot program. If you any of you are interested in being a part of that, um, let me know and I'll, I'll keep you. And I'm seeing head nods. Do you all want to be a part of that? <laughs> And I'm not sure, Christine, if you want to be as well, um, <laughs> because I'll grab people's email addresses and I'll put you into that conversation. Um, okay, excellent. 
And uh, yeah, but I think the idea around fostering more dialogue and, and conversation is, is really, uh, that was the key driver for us to get involved and create a network anyway. So I think that that's never going to go away. So we'll keep that moving forward. And Christine, I'm glad that you were able to engage and jump in with us. So you get a flavor in terms of what it is that we're mm -hmm. really about that professional approach and trying to support teachers in, in the work that they're doing. It's really interesting. And uh, you are going to see me again. <laughs> I'm really intrigued about how you have multiple teachers teaching a student and I, I'm curious to hear from you how they how, what how we set it up eh? sure eventually I'm, I'm, I'm going to I can show it to you well is that something that you want to we can schedule this up for another live session um, and make that the focus and topic and see if there's others who would be interested in jumping in that conversation mm. yeah, yeah the, <laughs> I will well, put you on the spot Consider it. You've got my contact information, so you can always yes. switch back. Yeah. yeah. ADLC, we have two teachers per student, but one is a, in a marker role. So they, have, they are a certified teacher, but they mark all of the work of the student. And then they have a teacher that they go, like, I'm the teacher, so they would come to me for questions and stuff. But we really have partnerships with, with teachers that work with the students, yeah. And, and I know of a school, uh, SIDES, a uh, Karen Fellow School, Gabe, um, where they actually use sort of three teachers, sometimes four if there's a counselor mm -hmm. that's involved, uh, that are engaging with those students. But they do use a teacher advisor model. Uh, and I've seen other models where there's uh, like a homeroom teacher. So a teacher that is responsible for the overall student is kind of their, it, it's not unlike in a private school where they have their, okay. their firm, uh, you know, leader sort of thing that is there. So somebody that's not really teaching them on the curricular side, but it's there to help with social emotional. So a lot of those strategies are in place and I'd be interested to see how that plays out in, in, in the situations, Christine, that you're, you're in as well. Mm -hmm. I think ultimately what I'm taking away from this conversation is that we're all trying to engage students to be uh, managing their own learning, to have some degree of control over it and to use multiple means to express themselves. And what I'm hearing is that that's exactly what we should be doing in professional learning and model that and make sure the two are in sync. For me, yeah. the challenge has been when I come into these situations, I think of myself as being responsible for modeling good practices for can -E learn And that's always a challenge and it pushes me individually. And I think if we all take that away and continue to focus on that, we'll all by osmosis, hopefully we'll change the world, right? We'll just roll out that same practice. <laughs> so any concluding thoughts, comments? We've got a little bit over the top of the hour. To add one thing, Michael uh, sure. talked about that a little bit. He said, you know what was important is that when we did the PD for the teachers, we made the teachers, you, um, the PD was used strategies that the teachers would have to use in the classroom. Okay, so if the, the teachers had to, let's say they decided they wanted to flip the class, mm -hmm. it was something new for them, then the PD was set up so that they actually, they would be doing the same things the student would have to do, right? And that became very effective because then once they did that, they had to reflect on it. And what, why would they use that strategy? How would it help the student? How would it help them as an instructor? And when you threw in the reflective component, and that's something I found this summer when I did the uh, professional development for the online teachers for summer school, the minute I threw in the, the reflective um, aspect to it, where they had to reflect each time that they chose something and why they did it, what they said at the end was that they realized that sometimes they were doing things in the classroom that they shouldn't have been doing, right? And when they had to think about it, then they realized the reason why they wanted to teach you know, uh, in a particular way and how they felt it would improve their instruction. And I think that's very, very important when we look at PD, you know, but it, again, that's a learning curve for the, um, the learner as well, you know, so we are hoping that teachers take charge of their own PD, just like we hope it's take charge of their own instruction in the classroom. Absolutely. Uh, so I think that whole reflection piece is really, really of paramount importance and is used in, in some of our professional learning that occurs in, in a structured um, setting. And I know it's used deliberately in, in university courses, et cetera, that, that reflection. And I think as professional practice, I think it's important for us to have that, but also model that. 
which is kind of interesting. So, um, Carrie, Gabe, any last thoughts? Uh, no, I really do. Um, I think I would like to continue this conversation, though, for sure, in the future. And um, it's really helped me not only as a teacher, but also like in my role as PD committee chair at ADLC, like just some of the things that I can start bringing back to the committee and saying, you know, like, how can we work this in and like the reflection piece. I, I mean, I attend PD all the time, but I'm not ever once asked to reflect on like I do it, but I mean, I don't report it to anyone. I don't share what I've learned with anyone. Right. So just trying to integrate that more like the sharing and the reflection part, you mm -hmm. know, across the board, not just as an individual. Mm -hmm. That's a good challenge. Now, as part of that commentary and reflection, um, how about if I ask you about that somewhere down the road and see how you're doing? Oh, for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think it, I think it would be helpful to come back to this conversation as well uh, to see how we rationalized it. So maybe that's something we can do a reprise of, of this professional learning approach and have it maybe in February, March, somewhere in the, the, the spring. Mm -hmm. Anyone, anything else? Okay, so I've, I've kind of tracked some of the notes and they're there as part of that Google Doc, so let me know. I will post them up uh, as well and try to begin to share out in a more structured way uh, the synthesis of some of these ideas that I'm engaged in in the conversations that I have with you guys and, and others in, in the network. So I'm looking forward to that and looking forward to Blend Ed and sharing some of that there and seeing if we can bring some of Blend Ed's conversations as well into a, a, a space and a place where we can share that forward for all. So Maggie, thank you on behalf of the network uh, for that. And thank you for all that were here. Joanna Sa Saunders from Saskatchewan uh, sent her around by email her regrets that she wanted to be here, but she got called into a meeting. She's working in the Ministry of Ed in Saskatchewan. So it was difficult for her. So thanks, Carrie. Uh, we'll see you uh, on Sunday, I guess. <laughs> And uh, thanks to the rest. And Gabe will probably chat again sometime real soon in the future. Maggie, do you mind hanging on? I just want to ask you about that little vignette before we close up. So thanks. I'll 